One of the other techniques that we're actually looking at at the moment and have been doing some small experiments with is working 2D imagery in a 3D volumetric space. So, for example, we would be having night vision um, scenarios, so people looking at a night vision monitor or night vision glasses and actually having that sitting in the air as a 2D separate in a 3D volumetric space, so you can actually walk around it, come around and look from both sides. Um, which again gives you a whole variety of different options and things to play with. Can you break that screen? Where does it move to? What can you do with it? Um, and just by building up um, a kind of world uh, involving the technology that you're trying to portray, it doesn't need to be technology in the case of any sort of visual effects, but in, in, in this particular case it is, you start creating a whole series of um, design points that actually have to tick up, and just, and because we're, we're doing it from scratch. Um, the language isn't there as to how to work and utilize visual effects it's in 3D, because as I think somebody else earlier pointed out, well, you can start moving with the interactual, you can start playing with that kind of aspect of what things look like. All of those things are distinctly possible um, and should be looked at. And, and within a visual effect, you can actually, if you want to grow that visual effect and change the interaction at the same time, you get the same kind of feeling in a way as that crash zoom out and push in on the camera or vice versa. And you can start pulling and sort of distorting um, your view of the world in a way sort of like sort of Escher's paintings. Um, the distance, the sort of you know, the wider your interaction or you're the closer in some of these, in some of, some of the kind of internal scenes in the van, for example, you have, uh, the van looks quite roomy. It's actually tiny. That's where we've set the interaction on that to actually include everybody, but also to bring in a degree of, um, uh, of claustrophobia, but also to bring you sort of sitting into that environment rather than watching it. So we could have pushed it back and you'd be looking like it, you're looking through a screen into somewhere else, but we want to bring you into it. It's not a pop in your eye, but it's quite extreme, some of the 3D in there. Um, working with the visual effects on that, those can then be shaped around the, sort of the, the, the idea of um, what one's sort of visual effect is going to be like. You can actually place where your convergence is actually going to sit in terms of actually either enhancing your uh, visual effects or actually reducing it. So um, in a specific in, uh, point in here, we have the overhead shot, which is a map painting of the van going through the kind of ruined city. That is a huge degree of stereo in there, but you're looking at it from a long way. And because you have a, re a specific amount of 3D, that really has to work quite extreme on an overhead because you don't have the reference. So that's been pulled out an awfully long way. We could, have, we could push down, we could move into it. Again, that would be an interesting um, work around and sort of going back to the sort of environment at the beginning. Uh, all of these things are kind of distinctly possible and we're just beginning to play uh, with them. So that can all change the perspective. You can actually change within, you know, for something that they might have done in Alice, which, did, which they didn't, which was for Alice herself when she's growing, you could actually shrink the interaction and make her seem much bigger just by the simple action of bringing the, bringing the camera points together, or vice versa, shrinking her out. Especially if you're doing as a, as a, a green screen or a blue screen set, you can um, change the background to fit or keep the background the same and just place her into that, into that volume. And you can actually do it in camera, quite a lot of those sort of things. And that's, I mean, huge benefits and huge fun. Um, so there are a lot of tricks and there are a lot of, um, I think there's a, there's a lot of thought to go into how to present um, really, really good visual effects. And I mean, there the are sort of principal um, areas of them. Some of them are kind of the sort of realist approach um, to try and make things fit, i.e. covering up, kind of rig removals, that sort of thing, um, which are follow a kind of a rule in order to try and fit into your, um, uh, into your world, make that world seem completely real. Um, there is a sort of surreal element, which some, th these are classes, sort of slightly surreal um, uh, idea that it's outside of a world, it's outside of something that you, you're particularly aware of. And then there's the hyperreal, which would actually bring something much more normal into a state that you're not quite 
certain how that can work. All of these things are perfectly attributable to 2D as well as 3D, but in 3D they can take on a different context because you can move around them and you can see them from a different angle. You can put them into, into a different space, if you like, and they affect your brain in a very different way. So as you actually look at them, you have to take in them as a solid, as a lump, as opposed to a 2D flat image. And that, in its essence, gives you um, a range of feeling and a range of emotion um, about that particular object. And it's, I don't quite know why it does it, but it, every single time it does. And it's, I'm pretty certain it's about the way that we understand our vision and that, that 3D being an optical illusion makes you feel in a different manner to a standard 2D. We know what 2D is like, we know how the language works, we know how editing works, and it's always evolving. 3D is going to be exactly the same, and the visual effects aspect of it is going to evolve rapidly and very, very, very beautifully, I think, uh, in the not too distant future. And everybody, lots of people in this room I know, are sort of working on it at the moment too. Um, and I just think it's going to be such fun. Thank you. Um, questions, uh, please. Um, does anyone like to raise that? I'm going to bring a microphone over. I'll bring this over to you. Hi there, uh, writer director Derek. Um, I just wanted to find out uh, how much um, that cost you, the, even the experiments and stuff. Uh, the whole thing was uh, just under 45,000. 45? Yeah. But that was a lot of beg, borrowing, and stealing, and a lot of, uh, a lot of help from, from, from some very good friends. <laughs> It doesn't, it's not representative of uh, the amount of work that was actually put into it. Um, that was mainly paying actors and location fees and things, and that was about it. On to another question. Yes, gentleman at the front. Thank you. Arturo Sinclair from Ithaca College in New York. Uh, you you um, made these um, tests to see what worked and what didn't, yeah. or what doesn't. Um, did you find some artifacts or some things that uh, normally you would say this wouldn't work, but if we turn it around, we can use it as, um, as a feature rather than a bug? Uh, we, were, we, were, we were trying to look at that, actually. This is when um, I was sort of discussing earlier about things like sort of motion blur and stuff, one of, the, one of the problems that we have at the moment with motion blur is actually you can't get a long motion blur on digital cameras at the moment. It's very hard, so it's something that you'd actually need to produce as a sort of a separate effect in, in, in post-production. But uh, working with, say, for example, um, a, a film camera, you can actually utilize that. And it was something that we were very much keen on um, trying to uh, use what could be considered as um, potential faults, but to see how we could, we could turn that around and actually make a kind of a feature out of it. Um, in this, possibly, I mean, the masks, I think, work be better um, than we were expecting. And I quite like the way that they sit off the face because it becomes, it's obviously a mask, it's not a, and that gives a kind of uh, an intention to it. Um, though I think, if we had more time, we would have placed it in a slightly different way and given it more obvious mask but a slightly better fitting feel. Um, but I do like the way that it seems to hover above, and that was slightly unintentional, but it's also um, because of the actresses we chose. Um, but the, the, the work that was done on that, I think, is fantastic because it works in a way that we didn't expect, but it also tells a story in the way that we wanted. Um, so that's, that is an example of it. But, uh, I think that, um, to go back to the question, what we found, we didn't actually have anything that we purposely turned to our benefit. There are some artifacts in there that, at a later stage, we might be able to utilize. Uh, things like, um, in terms of some of the map painting, what I would quite like to work with is go back to a kind of an old-fashioned form of glass painting and add map paintings to depths to that so you've got different layers and you can actually have almost like a screen of a sort of curtain effect which would be kind of really quite interesting to actually work with and if you're um, if you're not expecting that and your uh, your character or whatever is in fully rounded 3D and you're getting these sort of curtain effects going through then again you're distorting the perspective of what you're actually looking at um, to create a, 
either a discomfort or a feeling of wonder as you're walking through, as you're following the camera through. So um, things like that, if you look at some of the earlier um, map paintings in there, we have little mist joins on them, which just think, actually, you could go behind there. And that'd be really kind of quite a nice thing to go and have a look at. So yes, but we haven't done it, is the answer. <laughs> Another question, please. Um, gentleman there. Yep. Hello, my name is Michael Elphick, Director of Photography. Um, I was uh, interested with the snow. You were talking just a moment ago about uh, curtains. Um, yeah. And it appeared to me that there was only one curtain of snow, which was <laughs> in the foreground. Um, well, so um, was that a cost consideration or some uh, other? No, it's not a consideration. cost consideration. Uh, we ran out of snow candles. Um, and the, the snow that we did have, which we put in to enhance it, uh, which is actually fully 3D snow, it's not 2D snow, trying to, um, but it was only about sort of two meters in depth. So we tried to spread that out, but yes, it's not, it doesn't go back the entire stretch of the, of the, um, uh, of the shot. No, absolutely. But um, uh, yes, that was, I suppose the cost factor is we ran out of snow candles. <laughs> Further question, please? There's someone at the back there. Yes. Um, Neville Wertman, uh, director, writer, Polestar Pictures. I must congratulate you on really what must have been the most exciting and enjoyable exercise. Thank you very much indeed, it was. It um, does occur to me, though, that we're almost at the stage where the theatre was coming right out of the proscenium arch in theatre itself. And I wonder how you feel about leaving enough to the imagination and mind of the audience itself. Because while I was sitting here, what I was very aware of, I wasn't drawn into the movie itself like you are with some great movies. The effect that it often has is to suddenly have this image of a woman with a rifle sitting over the head of the top of someone sitting in front of me, just as an image. Uh, and it's... in the uh, car itself, you weren't exactly, I didn't feel myself as an audience anyway, drawn into the action itself, but just fascinated with the images that you had created. There's, there's a, there, there, are, there are a couple of potential reasons for that. Um, one is you're not sitting in a raked auditorium, so you are seeing people in front of you, which does um, reduce the effect of the stereo, uh, because you have a reference point that is outside of the screen. Um, I'm sorry that you weren't dragged into the film. That was our intention. It obviously didn't necessarily always work. Um, but uh, yes, bringing things into the auditorium has its, has its um, uh, issues as well as its, is, is its benefits. Um, and it is something that we're kind of uh, fairly aware and careful about how to use it. But um, it becomes a subjective issue as to whether you like it or you don't like it after a while. Um, I think some of what we have done uh, works better than others. Um, but again, you know, subjectively, some of the things that I like, um, my director doesn't like, and some of the things my director likes, I don't like. So um, in the end, I think it's, it's uh, how you enjoy or how you perceive and view your 3D experience. Um, but as I say, it would be uh, considerably enhanced when you're not seeing the edges and you're not seeing people's heads in front um, because that does break up your plane and the actual reality or the potential reality of what you're seeing on the screen.